growing up at a young age, I fell in love with cars. Um, anything fast, sounded loud, nice American V8, you can't not love it. Grew up in a little tourist town in Lake Michigan called Ludington. I spent my summers hanging around the beach or on the water. And I just had a normal childhood. Ever since I was little, basically I grew up wanting to be in the military. Growing up, I always looked up to uh, people in the military, had a certain respect for them and their commitment. April 12, 2009, I was uh, just driving around Iraq and <laughs> we're just on our way home uh, late, late at night one night and uh, got blown up. Um, instantly lost my arms and legs. 2012, we were in the Kandahar province of Afghanistan doing surveillance when our vehicle hit an IED. 30 days after the explosion, I woke up in Brook Army Medical Center in San Antonio, Texas. I was told I lost both my arms above the elbow. And... Many advances in plastic surgery have come as a result of wartime injury treatment. For example, the techniques for skin grafting, the techniques for adjacent tissue transfer, were developed or refined from treatments of injuries from World War I and II. The most recent conflicts were no different. The increased incidence of extremity amputations have resulted in transplantation for those brave wounded warriors whose lives have been transformed from the transplantation. Transplantation has developed really to the state-of-art treatment for patients with end-stage organ failure. And it's interesting that the field has started out uh, in plastic and reconstructive surgery with Dr. Joseph Murray being a plastic surgeon and performing the first kidney transplant now more than 60 years ago. So since these early days in transplantation with the development of more powerful and more sophisticated type of immunosuppressive agents, we were able to perform more complex type of transplants over the years, including liver transplants, pancreas transplants, intestinal transplants, and most recently, even reconstructive transplants such as hand and, and face transplants. The end goal of a transplant like this is to take somebody who has lost a lot of their independence, lost a lot of their function, and give it back to them. So this kind of a transplant is not a life-saving transplant, but it's a quality of life-saving transplant. And so nobody is going to die without having a hand transplant or an upper extremity transplant. But what we hope to do is give them back the life that they had before the injury or the loss that they experienced. I was just sitting watching basketball, I was like 10.30, in the morning and got a phone call from Dr. Shores telling me that they might have a match and there was a four o'clock flight I should get on. I felt um, see, overwhelmed, not ready, but uh, excited at the same time. And I got to Baltimore as fast as I could. Potential transplant candidates will undergo a rigorous screening process, which takes about a week. Uh, they'll have blood work done, and then they'll uh, see our surgical team, uh, as well as our hand therapist. Uh, then they will see a, a host of other medical specialists to get things such as CT scans or have their heart and lung health checked. And then finally, they'll see our psych team, which includes a transplant psychologist or psychiatrist, as well as a social worker to make sure that they have a strong social network available to them when they go home. For a double arm transplant, we start out with four surgical teams working simultaneously with at least three surgeons on each team. Two teams working on the right side, two teams working on the left side, and each team working on either preparation of the recipient arm or the section of the donor hand so we can join them together. At every transplant operation, we have a moment of drama, if you will, when we release the clamps on the blood vessels and let the blood flow into the transplant hand. Everyone in the operating room holds his or her breath because you can literally watch blood flowing into the transplant hand and the skin color of the hand turning from pale white to a nice pink. And that process can take 20 seconds to a minute. It's usually a time that everyone watch very closely. You will hear no talking in the operating room at that time. The first little movements there were were, you know, a month or two, probably three, four in. 
the, it was just a little a little flicker of a a, a finger basically because you you have you, your nerves have to grow down into your arm and and basically as they would grow you get more and more function and it's it's extremely exciting to watch happen because years of my life have been leading up to the arm transplant and to finally see it happen and then start to work it's huge i mean not only for me but for everyone around me so it it's just been exciting when i woke up in the hospital after the injury and was told i lost both my arms i felt i guess hopeless um, depressed i couldn't think of a reason to go on anymore now i feel more hope than I felt in a long time for my future. I have uh, something to shoot for, goals to work towards, and life feels uh, fulfilling. Seeing them progress not only with regards to feeling and, and sensory function, uh, but also with motor function has been just tremendous. Uh, we have seen patients go back to work, we have seen patients go back to school getting a degree and really getting back into a productive life and I think this is what this type of transplant is all about. It's restoring a patient to normalcy. Plastic surgery is really crucial to the functioning of a hospital. Certainly there's the aspect of the cosmetic part of plastic surgery but it's also so much more. The reconstruction aspects that allow us to take our patients who have devastating diagnoses and not only cure the underlying pathology, but restore them to a functional status, moving limbs, uh, feeling objects, connecting nerves, blood vessels, skin, all of that together to produce a functioning limb, it's remarkable. It is important for the plastic surgeon to be number one, proficient with all areas in the body, and number two, to really understand how to improve the patient's life. After all, we're not just improving the quality of life, in many times we're transforming the patient's life so they have better outlook, they have better function, they have better forms, so they can be integrated into the society more than they could before. Here I am, you know, I'm, I'm doing well, um, living with my girlfriend, and. Uh, taking care of myself essentially and, and that alone just kind of makes you feel good. If all that was to be gained was the, the added quality of life by you know being able to take care of yourself, it's worth it. You know, but there's been so many other great benefits to it, which for me are to, to get back into cars, and, which is truly what I love. So it's awesome. <laughs>